Today is Sunday, August the 11th, 2024. And I woke up this morning with the Old Dominion University Tri-Cities Center in my mind. And the first thing that I want to remind people is that I am a graduate of Old Dominion University. I received my master's degree in um, counseling and education from Old Dominion University in 1999. And so I'm well aware of Old Dominion as a university system, um, as well as how uh, instruction is organized, which is important. Um, but in addition to thinking about Old Dominion University, I thought about all the other dominions in Virginia, such as Dominion Power, and then of course the amusement park King's Dominion. And I just wanted to be able to collapse all of the Dominion partners in a way that makes sense. And what prompted this was a documentary on Lenintown that I shared um last night, and I also did a three minute um clip on which I'll I'll attach to the end of this video where um I learned about how anchor institutions are used um to gentrify areas in a cyclical pattern it's like they you know since these universities have been um developed and built in various communities across the country um, there's just this cycle of um, urban renewal and then, um, you know, an overtaking where the population in that area is um, pretty much decimated either by death or because they they leave the area to go somewhere else because they cannot maintain their lives in the communities um, that are surrounding these universities. And so I want it because... Old Dominion has these partnerships with Norfolk State University and Tywater Community College um, and some other organizations. And then they have these centers set up all over the region. I wanted to start to tie that together with the communities that are surrounding these, um, ca these campuses. The other thing that I wanted to mention is that, you know, the reason that I focus on Norfolk, Virginia in the region of um, Tidewater and Hampton Roads is because Norfolk, Virginia is like a microcosm of all of the problems that are happening across the country and internationally. It is the most heavily concentrated city in the entire country for all of these problematic systems. We have four hospitals, we have four or five uh, colleges or universities. We have the largest naval base in the world, all stationed in this one city, in this one area of Hampton Roads, in this one region of Tidewater. So it's significant to focus here. We also have a federal court um, building here in the city of Norfolk. And there is no federal department that does not have an entity with an office in the city of Norfolk. We also have a World Trade Center. So, you know, it makes sense that if you're going to deal with issues that are affecting the entire country and in fact, the entire world, that this would be where you would do it. So um, the first thing that I want to do is show you how I pieced together some of this legislation this morning to um, identify this digital equity plan that each state has been provided funds for um, as a result of the Title 47 um, and Section 1721 Digital Equity Act of 2021. Um, but I want to share these clip, this clip from the Linentown documentary because it will help sort of frame your mindset as we look at the legislation and how I was able to boil that down to find individual people who are responsible. So let's look at the clip. urban renewal, which means moving the Negroes out. Getting, it means Negro removal. That is what it means. And the federal government is, a, is, is, a, is an accomplice to this fact. The clearing of black neighborhoods under the guise of urban renewal and modernity had been mastered in American cities as early as the 1920s. But the American Housing Act of 1949 codified the practice, and a 1959 amendment to the bill allowed universities to apply for urban renewal loans 
from the Federal Housing Administration. The city of Athens wasted no time. That year, Mayor Ralph Snow wrote to University President Adderhald, quote, In an area adjacent to the university campus, we feel we do have a mutual problem that urban renewal would correct. By 1986, over $13 billion would be allocated to displacing over 300,000 American families, including 176 black Athenians, and over 70 universities would receive money for urban renewal into enemy territory. Urban renewal was the catch-all for a panoply of tactics meant to forcibly remove from sight and mind black populations in blighted neighborhoods. By refusing to provide loans, through the unequal implementation of laws such as the GI Bill, and in the case of Town, by refusing to pave roads, provide electricity, or extend sewage, cities intentionally created slums to justify their erasure. I want to pause here and give another perspective on urban renewal that is um, more biblical because, you know, I try my best to incorporate as many of these psychological weapons as I can to help free your mind so that you can think more um, realistically about what is going on around you in your own lives and in your own homes. And by now you should know that NOAA stands for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, which falls under the Department of Commerce, who also manages the census. But when you think about Noah's Ark and the flood and how Noah sent a raven and a dove out into the atmosphere, hoping that they would return, indicating that the floods were receding and they would reach land soon. You appreciate that militias are sent into thriving communities to terrorize it and then have people um, leave those areas, which is what gentrification is ultimately expecting that they are going to be provided domicile and a better life and better housing and so forth. But instead what happens is they sweep the area for those people once the area has been destroyed to get rid of them so that they can renew it again, so they can rebuild it again. UGA historian Cindy Hamovich reminds us that policy, not just poverty, resulted in slumming. Cities often pointed to low levels of home ownership or high levels of unemployment to justify the reorganization of slums. But in Linentown, 66% of families owned their homes, and 63% had at least one full-time wage earner. Recalling her childhood, Hattie Thomas Whitehead writes that no matter the circumstances, the people of Linentown supported each other. Linentown had brick masons, plumbers, electricians, and nurses. They drove their kids to school because the city would not send a school bus. One Linentown home also served as a black inn, one of the few places people of color could stay in the city. In truth, only two numbers mattered to the University of Georgia and the city of Athens. Linentown was one block away from an expanding campus, and most importantly, Linentown was 100% black. The practice of universities serving as anchor institutions for urban renewal began in the north. The practice of universities serving as anchor institutions for urban renewal began in the north. The practice of universities serving as anchor institutions for urban renewal began in the north. In Chicago, 4,000 black families were cleared from Hyde Park for the University of Chicago. In Philadelphia, the so-called pentrification of areas surrounding the University of Pennsylvania led to a dramatic 29% decline in the black population there. In New Haven, where Yale is the largest landlord in the city, low-rent storefronts have been decimated. In Boston, Harvard has purchased 250 acres in the neighborhood of Austin, gentrifying an area half the size of downtown Charlotte. To be clear, universities aren't doing this to be economic bulwarks. A 1993 New York Times article pins this down. The goal for urban universities is to, quote, preserve the character of the surrounding community so their campus remains attractive to future students and faculty members. The goal for urban universities is to, quote, preserve the character of the surrounding community so their campus remains attractive. The goal for urban universities is to, quote, preserve the character of the surrounding community. The goal for urban universities is to, quote, preserve the character of the surrounding community so their campus remains attractive to future students and faculty members. For leading northern universities, Preserving the character meant and continues to mean eradicating nearby poverty and the disproportionately black population subject to it. Metal gates encircling universities like Harvard are more than metaphorical. They're fortress-like structures delineating an educational and therefore class-based border. 
The adjacency of slums serves as a constant reminder of the extractive wealth used to build these ivory towers. For the University of Georgia, the 50 black families were a nagging, unavoidable reminder. What makes the clearing of Linentown all the more insidious is that the University of Georgia is a public university, state-owned and operated. The urban renewal grant application was championed by complicity at the municipal, county, and state level. Ironically, the University of Georgia today has used this very fact to hide behind its actions. The purchasing of land was done by the university system of Georgia, not the University of Georgia. If you want to find the people who are responsible for things that are having a negative impact on your life, your home, or your community, you have to follow the money. And in order to find the people responsible, you have to look at the legislation to find out who has the authorization and authority to handle the money. So I needed to find out how this term community anchor institution is used legislatively, which is how I found Title 47, Section 1721. Ultimately, I found that the Department of Housing and Community Development's Office of Broadband has been allocated the funds to form a community anchor institution in Virginia and, of course, in Norfolk. I'll show you how I found the DHCD in a moment, but first I want to share with you the organizational chart and why it's important. This is the organizational chart that I found on the DHCD website. And I just, it really caused me to pause because when you think in terms of what housing and community development should be, how these positions are broken down in the state of Virginia. So we have Brian Horn, who is the director who shares responsibility with Todd Weinstein, who is the chief deputy. So really, you know, they're on the same level. Regardless of title, these org charts really help to sort of break down the order of priority of different parts of a division. But look at the kinds of services that fall under this department. You have eviction prevention and rental assistance. You have um, procurement. You also have... Um, Economic development and community vitality. You have um, building and fire regulations, state building codes. You have um, community development, homeless and special needs housing, housing production and preservation. And then you also have this office of broadband. So it's like, you know, again, and I said this in the videos that I did yesterday. You know, when you are not um, immortal <laughs> and so your foundational mindset is not the primary goal of ensuring each person matures into a healthy adult who is able to find their eternal partner and then begin to raise a biological lineage of their own together to three generations, then, you know, you the way that you organize people and services and departments and things like that is not going to make any sense. It's always going to be around, you know, some new project that is, you know, it's, that's useless. It may be helpful in some capacities, but it's going to be useful long-term there. You know, all of these projects have no real long-term planning because if they did, you know, and you did, you were functioning in a mindset. And then what happens after that? And then after we do that, then what do we do? And then after that, what do we do? And then what comes next after that? So none of the projects that they implement have any long-term usefulness, which is why these um, problems are so cyclical. They just keep repeating themselves over and over because these projects come to a point where they are completed or almost completed and then they realize we really don't have anywhere else to go next and so then they abandon the project and then go start something else somewhere else and just leave it and so it you know it it achieves apathy and then it starts to decay and then you know now we got a project you know we can go back and fix it up again and so it's just it goes on and on and on and it's it's so critically important that people understand this is part of the reason why I'm against reparations and people receiving compensation for the things that have happened to them 
Because what you need to be asking for are the things you know you need in order to build your own families. It's building and developing families and people into healthy, safe, um, uh, caring individuals who are able to experience love and their full sense of creativity that should be the priority. And, and then anything else should be to make sure that there is no barrier to people being able to do that. And if people are focused on that, then everything we do is productive and meaningful and makes more sense and continues to evolve and grow and so on and so forth. Is this, is this making sense to anybody? So anyway, let, let's look at this legislation and sort of how I got to Brian Horn. The first thing I needed to do was go to Title 47 to see what the definition of the entire um, legislation is and what it was for. And as you can see here, it's telecommunications. And so that fit perfectly, but is not what I was expecting. So subsection 1721 really describes um, the Digital Equity Act of 2021. And it's also where I found the definition for a community anchor institution, which is described as a public school, a public or multifamily housing authority like um, HUD or NRHA, the Norfolk Redevelopment and Housing Authority. A library, we have an anchor library here in Norfolk. Um, the Jordan Library was built back in 2018 or so, I believe. A medical or health care provider, a community college or other institution of higher education, a state library agency, and any other nonprofit or governmental community support organization. So essentially, in 2021, states were tasked with coming up with a digital equity plan to submit to receive the federal funds. After uh, the plans were submitted and approved, then not less than 60 days after or not more than 60 days after that date, the state was to identify a entity who would serve as the agent to receive the funds and then to allocate them. What is important to know or understand about that is that as they made grants in a manner consistent with their own state plan, they are likely to use community anchor, uh, approved community anchor institutions to be able to implement those various aspects of the plan. And then again, you can see here that um, the administering entity is described in section B here, and then eligible entities who could who they could distribute funds to are found below, which align with what I just read before. When you consider what the Department of Housing and Community Development does, then you can appreciate which kinds of contracts um, or agencies would be receiving the funds that they have available. And that is how you can start to track it down to who in your community has this money. And it because they have this money, it means that they are actively involved in the installation and upgrading of the infrastructure similar to what I showed during my community ride a few days ago. I hope that this makes sense to somebody and that you will use it as an opportunity to track down who you need to hold accountable, who we all need to hold accountable so that we can move forward into Paradise Worldwide. Thank you.